Okay, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Richard Rogers. From, he's from the USA, I didn't know that. He's from Lawrence, Massachusetts. And he told me he's been living in Europe for the last 20 years. So, um, Richard Rogers, just a short presentation. He's a new media professor at the University of Amsterdam. He's director of the govcom.org foundation. It's a foundation that have received a lot of research grants from uh, the Dutch government, Soros Foundation, Open Society Institute, Ford Foundation, Open Society Foundations, etc. MacArthur Foundation, Gates Foundation, etc. He's visiting professor in science studies at the University of Vienna. He's Annenberg Fellow at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the most prestigious universities in the USA in media and communication. He's visiting a scholar in comparative media studies in Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the MIT. We have a couple of colleagues also. One of them is working there. And, uh, they go on back uh, to the MIT in comparative media studies. And he's founder of the Digital Method Initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, his academic work focuses on web epistemology, an area of study where the main claim is that the web is a knowledge culture distinct from other media. He's author of different books. He's author of information politics on the web from the MIT Press um, from 2004 and 2005. He was selected in 2005 the best information science book of the year by the American Society for Information Science and Technology. He has a, I have them here looking for the autograph. Uh, digital method and one classic this is from uh, 2013, okay, from the MIT Press also. It's a great book. It has been awarded by the International Communication Association, ICA, ICA, in 2014. And the last book, this one from Sage, uh, uh, Doing Digital Method, in 2019. And he's working in a new book called Critical Analytics for Social Media. So maybe later we can talk about the next book. Thanks for accepting the invitation. He has a very, very complicated agenda. Um, uh, we invited him to open the semana. Finally, he said, no, Friday. OK, we close with the keynote. Uh, he wanted to come on Saturday and Sunday. We said, no, no, we are close here. Uh, <laughs> sorry for the windy day. Usually, Barcelona has a beautiful weather, but sometimes we have also windy weather. We're in the Mediterranean at the end. Well, thanks for accepting the invitation. I'm going to sit in the first row. And he's going to talk about, uh, he's going to present his research um, for about one hour, and then he's going to, we are going to sit here so we have the conversation and with your questions also, okay? So thanks again, and your turn. Okay, <clears throat> thanks very much. Thanks for the kind invitation. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, what I'm gonna do uh, today um, is three things. The first is I'm gonna talk about Digital Methods, um, which, is the, which is the title of, the, of those two books. Uh, I'm going to talk about it historically. So what are digital methods in relation to internet studies research more generally, or the study of the internet, or the study of the web, actually, more specifically. Then secondly, I'm going to talk about digital methods um, epistemologically. I'm going to situate digital methods within the digital humanities as well as the digital social sciences, so to speak, um, and, and, and try to um, uh, make some distinctions between those three areas. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about digital methods practically. I'm going to go through the study of um, digital methods for social media research, largely the mainstream social media platforms. So I'll talk about uh, using digital methods to study Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Uh, and I'm also going to mention at the end uh, the deep vernacular web, uh, including 4chan and Reddit, and as well as Telegram, uh, which we've uh, recently developed uh, a tool to, uh, to study as well. Um, so that's the, uh, the agenda. So this is, the <clears throat> this is how I'd like to situate digital methods historically. Um, so generally speaking, um, the, uh, the study of the internet started with the study of something that was referred to as cyberspace. Now, nowadays, the word cyberspace, at least in the English language discourse, only appears very, in very specific sub-discourses, cybersecurity and infowar. 
But previously, cyberspace was thought to be of this sort of distinctive realm apart. Uh, and, and we projected a lot of ideas about the, uh, of, of ourselves and the future onto this, uh, onto this realm called cyberspace. We thought of it as a new potential neo-pluralistic space. We thought of it as a place for new kinds of identity play. We thought of it as a kind of space to re reinvent our bodies. So it was very much an imaginary. And those who studied cyberspace at the time studied it as a technological imaginary. Um, I think right around the, uh, the end of the 1990s, early 2000s, the social scientists arrive, and in particular, um, the ethnographers. And I'm referring to uh, not only Christine Hines' work on vigil, uh, um, virtual ethnography, but also um, Miller and Slater. And what they did was they grounded cyberspace. So they, they actually... Um, no longer thought of it as so much of an imaginary, but rather they went offline in order to study the online. So they went to cyber cafes, they used over-the-shoulder techniques, they interviewed, they surveyed, and they came up with a lot of interesting notions. Uh, so they grounded, they grounded cyberspace by, for example, coming up with the notion of the digital divide. Now, Sometime around 2007, and this is where um, I'm I would situate digital methods, sometime around uh, 2007, 2008, we had a, a quite a, what, what is now retrospectively referred to as the computational turn. And this turn um, it sort of inverted uh, the whole idea of what, of what cyberspace or what the online world was about. So previously it was thought as a realm apart or something quite separate. Uh, the, people would study online culture, but now, uh, beginning around 2007, people went online to study culture uh, or to study the societal. So no longer was it a space apart or no longer did it have a particular asterisk to it. Um, and I called this in a publication in a book, a, a booklet that I published in 2009, the end of the virtual. And the end of this virtual was a sort of declaration of the end of this sort of separate space, of the special separate space. Um, and I think that this also now in the most current era, um, which people refer to as the post-digital, I think it's something quite similar. So the post-digital has a couple of meanings. Um, one is that we no longer need to use the word digital as some sort of special adjective. Um, so digital methods, no, it's methods. Uh, so this is one particular idea that comes along with the, with the post-digital. The other, however, is um, something that is quite recent after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, we have what is now being referred to increasingly as platform lockdown. Um, and so we need, in order to study the societal, we can't only study it via the digital because the data is now being cut off from us, certainly on Facebook, which cut off its Pages API on the 4th of September of this year, certainly on Instagram, which cut off its uh, API in June of 2016. So now we're scraping and we're doing what is called post-API research. If you want to talk about that, I'll talk more about that during the workshop later this afternoon. So this is the periodization. So what I'm going to focus on largely is this third period uh, I'm not, this is also trans-historical. I'm not saying that one period has definitively ended and another one began. No, they're all layered and stacked. Uh, but uh, I want to concentrate uh, mostly on this, uh, this third one. And I want to start with an example of the sort of the, the, web, the, the web data turn. Uh, so what you see before you is a map of the US uh, with some states colored purple and others a different color. Um, these are uh, searches for recipes in a website called allrecipes.com um, the day before the American feast, which is Thanksgiving. And if there's an over, or sort of disproportionate high number of queries for a particular recipe in a particular region, it becomes darker. So sweet potato pie, therefore, is being searched uh, for, for, uh, in far greater quantities um, in the south. Macaroni and cheese, similarly. Sweet potato has a different geographical distribution. Corn casserole, that's the sort of the corn belt, so to speak. Uh, green beans in the west. Turkey brine to the north. 
yams uh, to the west. So what you see here is a kind of geography of taste. Uh, the geography of taste that is mapped via web data. And I would challenge you to think of ways to do this uh, without web data. And this is where the um, other notion that I have um, tried to coin comes into play. And this is the idea of online groundedness. So oftentimes people will make findings with web data and then they think, well, now we need to, really, we need to go offline and, and then we know it's true. Um, well, uh, with online groundedness, the question is, well, when is it appropriate, under which conditions can you ground your findings in the online? So for example, we could use Instagram pictures that people take of their food um, to ground these sorts of findings, for example. Um, this is, so the, whereas these are trends, this is then specificity. So this is, these are, this, is, this is a graphic that was published in the New York Times, I think in 2015 or 2014. These are the most specific recipes that people queried uh, per state. Um, and then you see um, things that you've never heard of before, um, like frog eye salad and funeral potatoes. So I mentioned the web as data turn, um, and, and I think that the, it, you could say that it goes back to a couple of very, very well-known pieces. One was by Duncan Watts, called The 21st Century Science, published in Nature in 2007. Another one, which is, I think, even more famous, probably even far more cited, is David Lazare and company's piece uh, on the computational turn on computational social science, which was uh, published in the journal Science in 2009. Now, both of these basically harked to a, a coming period where you would use web data to figure out what's happening in, in society and culture more generally. And so here, the emphasis on, is on traces. So the idea that we leave traces behind, footprints in the snow, which then scientists can use in order to find out tendencies, trends, indicators, etc. Now, it's become, that's a, that idea of social physics, as Sandy Penland's call it, that idea of, um, use, uh, of people leaving behind traces has been challenged recently, not that recently, it's been challenged probably from the beginning, because not only do people leave traces in social media, but social media is prompting you to do certain things. Um, so so there's, there are more than mere traces online, but nevertheless, um, that, was the, that was the idea uh, with the web as data turn. Now, um, this is a major sort of turning point. So you've heard, I guess, of Google, Google Flu Trends. Google Flu Trends was the flagship big data project uh, that Google.org, so the, the, the sort of non-governmental side of Google, um, actually implemented. And with Google Flu Trends, you could predict the incidence of flu and geolocate it um, faster and just as accurately, supposedly, than the traditional techniques. However, in 2012, 2013, something happened. Google Flu Trends was suddenly overestimating the incidence of flu by two times uh, in, in the US. So why was that happening? Well, what was happening was something that is a kind of warning to everyone who tries to use web data uh, as societal indicators. And so, so when it's flu season, and I guess it's flu season now, um, you might feel uh, symptoms. You might be coughing and sneezing, and then therefore you type into Google flu, flu-related symptoms, etc. right? Or you see that it's flu season because you're watching TV and it says it's flu season, and then you type into Google flu. So the question is, when you're doing these searches, um, does it reflect something that's happening in the wild? Or does it reflect something that's happening in media? And what's the difference? And how can you dis disentangle the, the two of them? So this was the, this was the, larger, the larger question in, in what is big data actually measuring? So what I would like to do now is uh, talk a little bit more epistemologically uh, rather than historically about uh, digital methods as a kind of concept. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'm gonna talk uh, epistemologically in, in this sense here. 
Um, I want to make the distinction that this is not a kind of religious distinction or it's not a fundamentalist distinction, but it's more of a provocative one. I'd like to make the distinction be between the, the digitized and the natively digital. Um, and this is something that does not refer to generations. This is not demographic. So this, this is, does not refer to the notion of the, the digital native at all. Rather, um, it refers to the idea that there are data that are, quote unquote, born in the medium and data that have migrated to the medium. So things that have been scanned or things that have been digitized. So there are the, there, there's that data that is, that is natively digital and that there is that data which is digitized. I also want to make the additional distinction on a methodological side. There's, there are methods that have migrated to the medium, survey, and there are methods that have been, in some sense, written for the medium. Uh, these are called, these I dub natively digital methods. And, and if you think along these lines, if you buy into this distinction, that's the first step, um, if you think along these lines, then you can begin to situate various approaches in the digital humanities and the digital social sciences. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, just a couple, what I feel are emblematic approaches. Uh, in the digital humanities, I want to talk about cultural analytics uh, and culturomics. And in the digital social sciences, I want to talk about webometrics and, and altmetrics. And then uh, I'll then contrast those approaches uh, with what I've called uh, digital methods, uh, just to nuance epistemologically where that notion is coming from. So I want to start with cultural analytics. Cultural analytics is, is quite uh, well known, I think, um, at least in the digital humanities. It outputs things like this. So this is an image wall, um, and it is an image wall that organizes the images according to either formal properties, uh, like saturation, hue, brightness, etc., or chronologically. And what Manovich argues when uh, when compiling this is that what what we have here. And th oh, by the way, these are the um, front page covers of Time magazine, this sort of tone setting American magazine. But but it's but he he's done these for uh, artists like Rothko, uh, Van Gogh. Um, and also um, video games, comics, etc. So this is a general technique, and, and you'll notice when I mention these that all of those things are, are digitized materials. Um, so what he argues is, is that you, what you create in that space or what you're analyzing is a style space. And with a style space, you can, you can see gradual changes in style at particular points in time, or different styles having been clustered because of their formal properties. Now, Manovich is, has a sort of um, a, a, an art history background, and so when you're grouping these things, they're grouped by formal properties, right? So these are, these are formalistic uh, groupings, materialistic, formalistic groupings. Now, what's interesting I find about Manovich is he's a big data proponent, and he makes a very sort of uh, what I find to be quite nuanced arguments about why big data is interesting. Arguments that are quite different from the social physics uh, definition. So what he argues is that big data allows you to no longer periodize. So you no longer have to make these, like, like I just did previously, you don't no longer have to make these periodizations. Rather, you can, you can, you can see continuous change. And you no longer have to categorize. You don't have to make categories because you can see continuous, you can, you can make continuous descriptions. So this is what he argues uh, as the interesting part of, uh, of big data. Just to give you another sense of, of cultural analytics, this is slightly different. This is just from his Selfie Cities project. So he took, um, he, he queried in the Instagram API at the time, he queried hashtag selfie. And then with the geo-coordinates of, of five cities, uh, Rio, Moscow, um, Tokyo, Los Angeles, and one other. Uh, and then he analyzed the formal properties of the selfies. And you can see what the properties are there. Uh, and ultimately, what he was doing was uh, doing a sort of city mood or city sentiment analysis. So what he found was that Rio 
was quite jolly and Moscow was quite grim. Um, okay, so that was the first one. The second one um, that I want to mention is, is Culturomics. Culturomics um, makes use of the Google Ngram viewer, so um, like this. So these are, this is the Google scanned book, uh, Google Books. So this is Google scanned books project. And there's a, there's a piece of software called the Ngram viewer where you can type in keywords and query them. And then you get their incidence uh, over the last sort of two centuries or more. Um, in uh, something like, at least in the English language, what they said was it's sort of 5% of all books ever printed. It's not only in English, it's in also in a number of other languages as well. And, and here you study uh, a, a trends, uh, different kinds of trends, at least as you can see them through the printed word. So you can see here the ups and downs of the interest in different kinds of math. Um, and here, the ups and downs in the interest in different kinds of characters, whether literary or scientific. One of the things that I found interesting about this work, and this is on this slide here, um, was, uh, so if you look this up, there are all these, uh, in, the, in the published studies, there are all these m little miniature projects that are, that are uh, described. This is also, in a, in a way, the same way that digital methods works, with, with small, self-contained uh, projects with, with, with a story to them. So one of these that I really liked was that they found that a celebrity is, is well-known historically for shorter and shorter periods of time, over time. So the, the idea of a celebrity and what a celebrity is and how long a celebrity is a celebrity has changed. For example, this is one of the projects. Okay, so in those cases, uh, what we uh, were looking at were digital humanities, quite flagship digital humanities approaches uh, and um, using largely digitized materials, so the scanned things, so scanned books on the one hand with the Ngram viewer and culturonomics, and scanned um, uh, artworks or magazine covers uh, with, with cultural analytics. So, so they also used what you could call digitized methods. So these, were, these are sort of methods that were drawn from art, art history or, or, uh, or other um, digitized traditions. Now I want to move now to the uh, di digital social sciences and talk only about two approaches that there are many, many more, but I think for me at least these are quite emblematic. So what these approaches do is they take natively digital objects like hyperlinks or likes and then they apply or digitized methods, scientometrics, bibliometrics, quite standardized uh, methods to them. So they take they take traditional, the, they take the social scientific instrumentarium and apply it to the new objects of study. This is quite a typical thing to do, um, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so this is the, the two things that I want to talk about are webometrics um, and altmetrics. So webometrics, and both of these are ways of measuring societal or in fact scientific reputation. So these are ways of deriving reputation ultimately. But initially, there are ways of deriving impact. So for example, um, here, this is a kind of webometric approach. Now, uh, what you see here, this is an output of a piece of software that I made. It's the issue crawler. Um, so it's not, a, it's not from this, it's not from Thelwall in the, in the specific web, webometric community. But nevertheless, this is one example. Um, and this is a kind of typical graph. Um, people nowadays are, are you know, beginning to critique the hegemony of the graph, um, especially in, in this, kind of, this kind of work, big data work or sm even medium size or smaller data work. You know, why do we always need to see the graph? Uh, okay, um, however, here's a graph. Um, and so this is, this, is, this is a hyperlink network, so there are, there are the, the nodes are websites and the edges or the, the connections are links and it's a, it's a directed uh, network map, so there are arrows. Um, and I just want to mention what this is. Uh, so um, there are basically two clusters. One is uh, of basically the, the blue dots and these are Armenian NGOs. Armenian NGOs, NGOs from Armenia, right? And they're linking to one another quite massively. 
Then the other, uh, the yellow ones, those are um, UN agencies largely, intergovernmental, and they're, high, they're, they're interlinking. Okay, so here's the story. The Armenian NGOs link to the UN, and the UN does not link back. So this is very, very typical politics of association where you can see reputations um, or, or reputation making or the, represent, or the reputational uh, in action through hyperlink analysis. So you, you, you see here uh, how that is, uh, is measured or an example of it. Okay, um, alt metrics. Now, I don't know if you've, you probably have seen, have you seen this donut? Um, this colorful donut published next to an article, um, a scientific article, when you've looked up something. Well, this, this donut, uh, this is from an, um, I mean, there's a variety of ways you can get to it. You can actually also install a kind of bookmarklet or sort of extension. Uh, so you can, you can generate donuts uh, when you are looking at a scientific article. And so what these are, uh, these are alt metrics. Um, and alt metrics, uh, as a, a form of scientometrics, but instead of, of studying in the webometric sen sense, links, hyperlinks, or in the classic sci scientometrical bibliometric sense, uh, uh, citations, they're studying um, likes, basically. Uh, but it's not just likes, it's, it's retweets. Um, so it's mentions, in, it's references or mentions in social media. And the social media here is also academic social media, so it's kind of interesting. So it's, so it's also Zotero, Mendeley, so, the, so these, these, the kind of academic social bookmarking software, you can also call them uh, bibli online bibliographies. So it's measuring um, mentions of articles in social media. These are, these are alt metrics. Um, uh, so this is this is so in this case, as in the case of webometrics, we have the study of natively digital objects. Um, then using digit using digitized methods, so digitized scientometrics, so to speak. Okay, so some some of my colleagues um, say, well, Richard, what about that blank box over there? Uh, what's in there? Um, so the, I'm, I'm sure that there are, th I mean, this one colleague of mine has actually come up with an example of, um, of, of an, an approach over there. I, I, I'm not quite sure yet, but anyway, I'm just going to move to the bottom right, and this is the digital methods. Um, so I want to start by t uh, mentioning a little bit in more depth what I mean by the notion of the natively digital. So some people might think, oh, that's a kind of anthropological idea. It's not. Uh, it actually comes. It's, it comes from computational culture, and it's the idea of the native. So you can run native Facebook ads. Um, I have a native Apple adapter here. Um, so a native, native in a computing sense is that which is written for the processor. It's not emulated, right? So it's, it's native in that sense. And so when I talk about the natively digital. And I, I don't know how elegant that notion is in any language, English or, or other languages. Um, but when I talk about the natively digital, I mean that which has been written for the medium uh, and to work and to survive and to be adapted so it continues to work and survive in the medium. Um, and so this is then things like things, anything from uh, crowdsourcing and, and folksonomies and these sorts of things to to sort of page ranks and all the kind of analytics, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that, then, that, then, that then end up in feeds or filters or recommendations. So these are the sorts of things. These are the, these are the natively digital uh, methods. And I contrast them with the digitized or digitized methods, the idea that there are online surveys, that there are all sorts of methods that have migrated and that have adapted um, to the medium, but they're not written specifically for the medium. Or you could say that there's a gray area there. Um, that, that, that you could also argue more radically that all methods come from elsewhere. There is no such thing as the natively digital. Everything is an ad adaptation. Well, OK, I would agree with you. However, some are adapted more radically or optimized for the medium, and others are more clunky. Um, so what are digital methods then? Um, to me, digital methods are kind of like a software project. Um, it's a very different, 
it's a very different research philosophy, um, and it's not for everybody. Uh, but it's it's interesting as an approach. So um, the the gambit is is that you look at a platform or a medium or um, you know Wikipedia for example, and then you say well what kind of digital objects are available? Okay, well you have different language versions of the same Wikipedia article. You have edit histories. You have you have uh, timestamps. You have all sorts of different things. Um, digital objects. And then you say, well, how do the um, dominant sort of engines or devices or platforms of the medium oftentimes handle those objects? What does Google do with hyperlinks? What does Facebook do with likes? And then you say, well, how can we repurpose those methods of the medium or how can we repurpose those feeds or those filters in order to do social and cultural research? So digital methods are, are kind of a webby approach to doing research in the sense that they remix or repurpose um, the data and the methods of the medium for social and cultural research. And so what I'm going to do now, oh yeah, and then the last part, as I mentioned before, um, there's also a, a, a harder epistemological problem. And that is when you begin to make findings in the online, can they be grounded there? Or do you have to go offline? Do you always have to do, quote unquote, uh, uh, mixed methods in a sort of online, offline way? There are a number of mixed methods types. There's quality, quantity, and, but this is online, offline mixed methods. Does that have, or can you ground your findings uh, in, the, in the online? Okay, so what I'm gonna do in the, with the remaining time um, is I'm gonna talk about uh, um, digital methods practically now. There have been a, a lot of different things developed over the past uh, 10 years, so these are some of them. Um, this, this is also, all of these particular methods are written up in the new book, the Doing Digital Methods book. So how do you study hyperlinks? I gave you the, uh, one, of the, one of the pictures. Another one is um, the study of internet censorship, uh, in-depth study of internet censorship. Uh, another one is archived websites, making use of the Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine in order to, to make screencast documentaries, like time-lapse photography of the evolution of a website over time and then narrate the changes thereof. Like, for example, how whitehouse.gov, the sort of tone-setting American presidential website, changes quite radically when a new president transitions in. Um, there's a discussion of how to repurpose search engines um, and how to, t how to study Wikipedia. So um, I'm not going to talk about those. That would take uh, far too much time. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, talk mainly about social media um, today. I think a lot of people are really interested in, in researching social media. I think it's, it's um, uh, also uh, quite poignant these days. Um, so I'm going to spend some time... So this is, this is the way the book's laid out. Um, I have laid it out slightly differently. Um, one of the things that I want to mention, I'm not going to go into this uh, in depth today, but what I want to mention this to you, we can also talk about it in the workshop, is that a lot of this work suffers from what I call single platform studies. So, oh, another Twitter study. Oh, another Facebook study. Oh, another Instagram study. Um, whereas... Uh, when you're doing societal and cultural research, you probably want to do cross-platform analysis. Um, and that's not that straightforward because, um, well, what, what, what is it that you compare across platforms? If you want to compare a hashtag, for example, you'll, you'll immediately realize, well, actually, there are really no hashtags on Facebook. And they're used very, very differently on Instagram than they are on Twitter. On Twitter, it's considered poor practice if you use more than three hashtags. On Instagram, it's considered poor practice if you use less than three. Um, so so uh, th they're very, very different. So the cross in cross-platform analysis requires an understanding of web vernaculars. I'm not going to get or platform vernaculars or the culture of use of those platforms. So I'm not going to... Uh, go into that any further, but uh, I want to mention that now. So I'll talk about Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm not going to talk about trackers, uh, cookies, and third-party elements, but we can talk about that um, in the workshop if you want to. Okay, Twitter study. So, so I'll just do four platforms, uh, or I'll, I, may, I might mention Telegram as well. 
Um, okay, so Twitter. Um, so we've developed a number of approaches to study uh, Twitter. Um, I, I want to get into them, but first I want to base. I want to give you a kind of little sort of small periodization of Twitter. Uh, I think Twitter has changed quite dramatically over the years. Um, so Twitter started off as something quite banal. It was oftentimes referred to as the what I had for lunch medium. Um, and people were using it to sort of tweet their favorite flavor of burrito, as was critiqued. Um, and that coincided with Jack Dorsey's original Twitter. So that's the what are you doing Twitter. That was the motto. Um, and that, that kind of changed. Um, but before we get to the change, I just want to show you the original Twitter sketch. This is kind of a fascinating document in and of itself. So this is what Dorsey sketched out as the original Twitter. You can see that he used a domain hack. So stat.us, so status was going to be the, the URL. And you can see who it was directed to. It was directed to sort of young San Francisco urbanites who, as default settings, were either in bed or going to the park. Nice life. Um, so this, this, um, this changed uh, quite dramatically somewhere around uh, 2009. I mean, not only did it coincide with, and this, there's, a, there's a longer sub-story to this, but it coincided with the change of the motto to what's happening. Um, but it also was interesting how Twitter almost overnight went from the what I had for lunch medium to a revolutionary medium. Uh, where you were following events as they unfolded uh, remotely. So this is, uh, this is a particular approach that I want to talk a, a, a little bit about, um, and that is re remote event analysis. So this is the uh, Je suis Charlie, um, of course, with the Charlie Hebdo attack in Paris, uh, the, the, and, and those tweeting about it. So it's not, it's, it's not uh, localized. It's, a, it's, a, it's also uh, when you're studying... Uh, events remotely. You can also study their reception uh, uh, globally. So generally speaking, we set up a very, very simple technique to try to capture an event um, uh, in, uh, on Twitter, uh, on Twitter and on the ground at the same time, to create a, a tweet collection that enabled you to turn Twitter into a sort of event, a sort of storytelling machine. So this is more of an artwork. This is a media artwork. This was, in fact, just uh, displayed here, I think, in Barcelona, uh, 2012, I think it was. Um, uh, nevertheless, what we did here is we took the top three retweets per day for, for the hashtag uh, Iran elections, uh, and then took the top re retweets per day and put them in chronological order versus the, uh, as opposed to the reverse chronological order. Um, and this, we were able to then capture in essence what happened in those 20 days during the Iran election crisis of 2009, which we ultimately boiled down to the size of a, of a single tweet. So this particular technique is a technique for quote unquote remote event analysis. However, there are a number of other techniques that I want to briefly uh, talk about. One is to treat issue as a, a treat uh, Twitter as an issue space. Twitter is used professionally, of course, by issue professionals. Um, this was a piece of work that we did um, for the Gates Foundation. There, when you look at Twitter analysis software, and we made a, a piece, it's called TCAT, or, or DMI. TCAT, which you can uh, download and install on a server and use uh, to uh, capture tweets using the streaming API. Uh, when you see this kind of software, you normally see a, a lot of modules uh, of all sorts of things you can do. So what I've done is, is created a, a number of sort of simple recipes in order to study uh, spaces. So for example, um, this is, a, this is um, a hashtag analysis. This is just a frequency analysis. You can also do co-hashtags. But, if, but hashtags are oftentimes embedded social issues. And so when you do a frequency analysis, uh, you can see the sort of issue agenda of a particular issue space. So this is global health uh, and development. Um, the other one is, um, is to the study of dominant voice. So if you look at an issue space, so you, can, you can ask, well, who's tweeting the most? But you can also ask, who's being mentioned the most? And so this is, uh, again, this is the, the global health space. And you see the Gates Foundation, which is the major donor in that space, and, and Bill himself being the ones who are, are, are uh, engaged with, are mentioned the most. And then the third one 
um, is a URL analysis. So this, this is a kind of content analysis, so it extracts the URLs uh, from, um, so what you see here are um, Hillary, Hillary supporters, this is the 2016 US elections, and the, and the media sources that they, uh, that they tweet, um, and then Trump supporters and the media sources that they tweet. And you can see that there are only, this is a classic polarization uh, graph, um, but and you can see there, there are only a couple of sources in the middle that they both mention. Um, what's also interesting about this is if you look at the, at the Hillary media mentions, um, you see that they're quite mainstream, whereas the Trump ones you see are quite extremist. Uh, so that was already a kind of uh, indication of the sort of turn to the right of the web. This is um, um, a segmented audience. So this is, tw Twitter does not want you to do this. Um, it's kind of against their terms of service, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something that is a legitimate thing to do uh, for research. Twitter doesn't want you to uh, uh, segment an, an audience or segment a social group or a social movement and then spy on them, basically. Um, uh, that particular, this is in the developer terms of service, that particular prescript is, is largely for governments. Uh, it, I don't think it applies so much to academic researchers. Uh, there are reasons that one would want to do this. This is before that they were deplatformed, or most of them, by Twitter. These were the alt-right core uh, um, uh, Twitter accounts. And what we did in order to sort of segment the alt-right and its audience uh, was to take um, those uh, um, users that were mentioned by the core. And these are, these are by all of the core or seven members of the core mentioned by six, five, four. So you, basically you get this sort of, this kind of alt-right supporter uh, network, so to speak. The last one I wanna show you um, is uh, public, figure public figure analysis. I mean, the, the, I don't know if you've seen this before. This is one of the funniest. Um, the 567 people, places, and things Donald Trump has insulted on Twitter. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is, this is more data journalism. Um, this isn't so academic, but it's basically making, you, take a, you make a tweet collection uh, of uh, a particular politician. Um, I know that uh, our Italian friends are doing this for, for like Salvini um, and, and others, so it's, um, so, uh, so this is an example that's a little bit more academic. So this is the populist politician uh, Geert Wilders the, in the Netherlands. Um, and the question here, to what extent should he be considered to be a part of the new right, where the new right is defined, according to the London-based think tank Demos, as having particular characteristics, as being anti-establishment, anti-globalization, anti-immigrant, etc. And then you characterize the treats qualitatively. You can also use some, some quantitative techniques, some natural language processing. You can also try to do some machine learning here if you want to. But nevertheless, this is a, an example of public uh, figure analysis. So that's, uh, that's Twitter. Um, I want to talk about Facebook. <clears throat> Facebook is something that also has uh, evolved over the years quite, quite radically, I would say, at least it's study. So it started as something that people would basically study plat uh, profiles and friends. And there was always this quotation marks, friends, right? And then we'd be like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, so, and, and this was oftentimes a social network analysis of tastes and ties. Um, now that became, and, the, and there, there were some, there were some ethical issues there, and that, that became sort of, I mean, I just want to show you this. I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Social Network. Uh, do you recognize this guy? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Um, so you see, this is, this is, so he's the guy in the movie that, told, that tells Mark Zuckerberg, so, so it says, it's like the Facebook. He said, no, no, he says, drop the the, it's really lame. It should just be Facebook. That's him, uh, that's Sean Parker. He was also the developer of Napster, the great disruptor. You can see in the early Facebook, um, the profile was sort of the most important, right? It was like, what are your tastes? What are your interests? And this one is also kind of quasi dating idea. Um, so that, that was, that's what often people uh, studied. And when we, when we studied um, profiles uh, and, and interests in particular, we came up with this term uh, as, a, as an approach. This is a, a, an approach to Facebook 
uh, first era studies. We call it post-demographics, and I just want to show you one of the outcomes. This was, again, more of an art piece, although we did publish academically on this as well. Um, so this was um, uh, a um, look at the top 1,000 friends of Obama and the top 1,000 friends of McCain. This was before the 20, 2008 elections, I think. And then their interests. And then we're studying the extent to which they were compatible. So we're studying here culture wars. We're studying here the politics of media. So I'll just give you an example. So for example, the Obama uh, friends, their favorite TV shows are The Daily Show, Lost, and uh, the Republican, McCain, the favorite TV shows are Family Guy, Project Runway, America's Next Top Model, CSI, Desperate Housewives. Uh, so you see something quite different. Uh, you see very, very different uh, uh, politics in, in, in media. You can also do this for an interest. So, what, uh, so, so like if you have an interest chess, so what are the most related interests? So in this case, Smallville and Batman. Um, I mean, this wasn't the turning point. It may have been the turning point in, in academia. Uh, this, I mean, I think we're now really experiencing a kind of ethics turn. Uh, you could say that it started here. This is 2010. This is, this is the, the Taste and Ties research that was done by some researchers at Harvard and Michael Zimmer of the University of Milwaukee uh, at uh, the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee was able to de-anonymize the, the, the data that, the, that he, he used, he was able to, he looked at some of the, some of the statements that were made of uh, the posts, searched Facebook for texts in the posts, and then found the individuals. Um, and so this sort of de-anonymization prompted a lot of kind of uh, ethical uh, questions in doing social media research. Um, it also uh, prompted, um, it also coincided with the changes in Facebook's API from 1.0 to 2.0, and the shift from studying sort of uh, profiles and interests uh, to studying pages. And um, uh, this is probably the most famous Facebook page, I think, or at least it is to me. This is We Are All Khaled Said, the Egyptian Revolution of 2011. So this sort of kind of summarized, in some sense, its study summarized the change in, in what people were, were interested in. So we developed a couple of techniques. One was uh, interliked page analysis, the other one networked content analysis. So here you see pages can like other pages. And what you see here is the sort of the kind of extremist right wing in Europe. This is in 2014, I think this was. Uh, and, and the pages that are liking other pages, and you, and you get a network there. At the time, so this is, I mean, when, the, when there was the Cambridge Analytica scandal, it was found out, or it was in the public imagination that what, you could used to get the names of the administrators? Of, yes, well, this is, and I put this up here, um, not for you to tweet it, uh, I, because n normally I wouldn't publish this, but I want to show it to you, uh, because uh, this is, this is um, um, these are memberships of groups by extremists, right-wing extremists in Europe, and the one in the middle is the uh, uh, administrators, and the one in the middle um, is the one that is the member of the most extremist groups uh, on Facebook, at least in 2014. So you could get these kinds of pictures. The other, this is networked content analysis. This is, I should warn you, uh, this, is not, this is not that nice. It's very offensive. So this is uh, the uh, Islamophobic Stop Islamization movement. And what you do here is engagement analysis. So which posts of a collection of pages have the most like shares and, and, and uh, comments. This is sort of standard engagement, or, or Facebook calls it interactions. So you can do engagement analysis, and when you do that, what you find is that the most engaged with content is oftentimes, oftentimes or, or universally, in fact, memes. So when you study engagement on Facebook, you end up studying memes. Um, and um, what's interesting about memes is that they're different from viral. So a viral is a single piece of content, and a meme is a collection of content. And what you do when you meme is that you contribute to a collection of content. So memes are additive, and they're, they're also said to, they're, they're additive in two senses, both in a, in a contribution sense, but also in a, a cognitive sense. You're added, added, additive uh, cognition. 
Okay, that's Facebook. I just have, um, this is fake news. I'm not going to go into that. Okay, I want to talk uh, just about Instagram and, and then YouTube and then we're done. Um, Instagram, um, I think, well, the two, the two techniques that we've developed is uh, to study antagonistic hashtag publics. Um, as well as artificial amplification, and, and I'll, I'll mention those. But first, I want to just do what I did with the other ones here also for Instagram. I think Instagram, of course, is very well known um, as being uh, a site for the study of selfies and selfie culture. Uh, I think that shifted a little bit. I mean, it's still going on, but I think that it shifted a little bit with the rise of sort of antagonistic hashtags. So first, uh, I just want to show you that this is the first Instagram photo ever. Um, this is Kevin Sistrom, the, the founder of Instagram. That's his girlfriend's foot, uh, and that's his, their dog. So this is a kind of family selfie. So this is the sort of opening of Instagram, right? So it's, it's quite selfie-ish. Um, and as I, as I showed you before, this is the, the academic study thereof, right? So there's studying selfie cities, studying uh, selfies around the world for their formal properties. Um, I think that that shifted a little bit um, with the rise of using uh, Instagram also for social causes and issue work. So this is Justin Bieber, uh, the celebrity, the influencer uh, tweeting about Black Lives Matter, but it is a or tweeting, posting, and it is a antagonistic space because the, it, it's also um, a space where you have uh, things like all lives matter as a kind of counterpoint to black lives matter. So here, um, to, to study uh, antagonistic hashtag publics, we uh, adapted the model from uh, Bruno Latour, uh, studying programs and anti-programs, and this is from the 2015 U.S. Supreme Court's same-sex marriage decision, where you had the proliferation of the hashtag love wins, followed by the proliferation of the hashtag love loses and Jesus wins. So when studying antagonistic hashtag publics, you can study filter activism, the extent of it. Of course, Instagram is well known for its filters. But you can also study the location. So this is like geolocating hate, so to speak, or the geography of hate. Uh, and then you can see the program is being far more widespread uh, and the anti-program is being quite specific and, and uh, geolocatable. Um, yeah, this is follow, follower ecologies. I'm not going to go into that. Okay. And then the second one I want to talk about is, um, is uh, artificial amplification. So Instagram, as you know, has the biggest market for fake stuff, fake followers in this particular case, followed, I think, in second by YouTube and then in third place by Twitter. The markets are international. Um, it, you can buy fake followers in Germany uh, from German companies and they're quality fake followers. And you can buy them in Indonesia where they're cheaper. Uh, and you can buy them in Brazil where they're the cheapest. Uh, and, and there's a huge market for them and it's very interesting to study this market. It's also very interesting to study what, uh, how people um, define fake followers. This is one technique. Um, this is using the tool Hype Monitor, um, which recently went offline. I don't know wh whether they're gonna relaunch it, but there are a number of tools. Uh, and it's interesting to look at the, all the different techniques for deriving fakeness. It's the same as looking at all the different techniques for deriving botness on Twitter, for example. It's a very interesting area of study. Uh, and so here, this is this was applied to the U.S. Uh, to the Netherlands uh, elections uh, recently uh, in 2019. So we did the so our group did the fake news study uh, for the Dutch Ministry of Internal Affairs. It's going to come out as a book. Uh, quite soon. It's called The Politics of Social Media Manipulation, and this is one of the products that thereof. Uh, and then you can see, um, so what's also interesting, you can see who has the most fake followers, like that's uh, Gerd Wilders, the populist politician by far. But it's also interesting to note that, that there's a normal uh, percentage of fake followers. Uh, something like 18% is normally fake. And uh, we can talk about that. Okay, the last one, um, YouTube. Um, these are four different techniques um, that we've developed to study YouTube. So all of these techniques, f uh, they're, they're platform-centric, huh? Uh, 
They follow the platform and the API and they, re they make use of what's available and they repurpose it for social media, for societal research or cultural research. Yeah? So these are platform-centric techniques. There are many, many other techniques that one could use in order to study these platforms. So I'll give you, uh, YouTube is the final example. Um, so YouTube has oftentimes been described as an excitable algorithm. Um, so you can study its excitability, uh, for example, uh, by um, I'll go to that. Oops. by um, looking at the the carousel. So what's up next, and and um, and looking also the second one is the extent to which it's a rabbit hole. So whether or not what's up next um, pushes you to more and more extremist videos. So these are the, these are a couple of claims that are often made. You can also map channel networks. So channels can subscribe to other channels. So you, you can also do a network analysis on, on YouTube. And finally, YouTube has been deleting a lot of stuff lately, um, a lot. And it is, it is difficult to actually determine what has been deleted and why, or actually how. And there's the question of the extent to which YouTube is deleting things automatically without humans in the loop. Um, and then and the politics thereof, uh, and uh, and how YouTube's politics are also being challenged, especially by the right, uh, and especially by those who have been deplatformed or removed from from social media. So deplatforming is also an up and coming uh, topic. Um, I think YouTube um, can be e easily periodized. Um, I've also done this in the doing uh, digital methods book. I think YouTube started as an amateur production space. I think that is in evidence if you look at the top videos by view count and you do time slices. So if you do top videos by view count 2006 to 2010, 2010 to 2014, what you'll notice in the first period is that they're amateur videos. Charlie bit my finger. You know this one? I mean, or the evolution of dance. There's this one guy doing 20 dances, it's really, right? So those are the top videos. Around, not, around 2011 was the first year, I think it was 2011, where all the top videos, the top 50, were um, commercial productions, you know? so music videos. Uh, so it changed quite dramatically. Um, also what you saw in the second period was the rise of the monetization uh, of YouTube. Um, so I'll just, wait, I'll just, let me show you first the three so this is, the, this is from the Internet Archive, from the Wayback Machine. This is the very first uh, screenshot of YouTube that's still available, at least publicly. Uh, you, I mean, it was originally a kind of dating site. I mean, no one seems to know this. Uh, so you would broadcast yourself with short clips of yourself. That was the idea. Broadcast, you know, we, we, we later um, considered broadcasting yourself to mean, uh, you know, sort of amateur, amateur productions. Um, yeah, the rise of the YouTuber, I think, is, uh, is fascinating, um, and the monetization, um, and, then, and then also the, the, the controversiality around um, that nowadays. So, you know, you need to have 100,000 um, uh, subscribers in order to use the content matching tools to see whether someone else is using your content and earning money off of it. Why 100,000 followers, you know, or, or subscribers? Why not, a, why not a lower figure? It's not very sort of democratizing. So, so, and then YouTube really heavily leaning on its, its, uh, its, its, its YouTubers, um, f also for its own, uh, own, own profit making. So that's that. And then we get to the current period um, where there's a lot of stuff um, that, is, um, that is being deleted. So I want to just show you the techniques in brief and then uh, wrap up. Um, so, this is, so when you use YouTube API, which is very generous, by the way, one of the most generous social media platforms, and it, and it works, you know, they're not endlessly changing things. I mean, they did change something recently, but okay. Um, so this is search, and the query here is Syrian war. Uh, and then you see, uh, this is a rank flow diagram, and so it shows sort of uh, the res where in a result count where, where in a rank a video is over time. And so videos can go up and down in, in ranking over time. And so it, with the Syrian war, what we saw here was, was when there was a gas attack or something like this, uh, YouTube became, the algorithm became excitable and more extremist videos would be towards the top. 
uh, right around those periods. So this is, this is uh, one way to study. So this is a, what I call a source distance approach. So how far from the top are particular sources? A second one, this is um, um, another network, uh, but this is, this is a, a channel. This is who, who subscribes to whom and who features whom. This is the alt-right again. Uh, and what we noticed is that you could, you could um, distill business relationships between alt-right extremist internet celebrities by seeing who featured whom. Um, you can make larger, um, this is actually a related channel network, but you can make also um, ch uh, subscription networks, so which channels subscribe to which channels uh, that, that look like this. So these are, these are basically the four, there's also this one, which is not uh, a technique that you can use with the API. Uh, you would have to do this a bit differently. Um, so what we did here, and this allows me to segue into the, the, the deep vernacular web. So we took uh, uh, the most popular, popular is a weird term to use for this, uh, 4chan board, uh, uh, which, uh, politically incorrect, so Paul, and we looked at the YouTube videos. We, took the, we just basically took out all the YouTube videos that were referenced in this particular uh, 4chan board, which is quite extremist. Um, and then um, uh, six months later, looked up to see where, whether the videos were still available on YouTube. Ta-da! So half of them are gone. Um, and we do have traces of what the videos were, and, and a lot of the researchers, this, I didn't work on this project, it was my colleagues, they said, well, you know, I mean, maybe they've become a bit immune to, to extremist stuff, studying extremist stuff, but they were like, this, a lot of this stuff wasn't that bad. The other thing that was interesting was that if they looked at the traces um, of, of when they were deleted, and they were all deleted basically around the same time. Um, so it, it was as if they were deleted automatically, um, and which raises questions about the extent to which humans are in the loop, who's looking at this stuff, uh, et cetera. So I want to just um, uh, conclude um, by um, reiterating that the methods that I presented to you are quite specific. There's a specific history to them. There's a specific epistemology to them. And there's also a specific platform uh, centricity to them or medium specificity to them. So uh, they're not for everyone, uh, but they may be for some of you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Richard. You are coming here, yeah. so we can talk a little bit. Uh, Lorena, you have the other, the second. I oh, know we have. Um, okay, I'm going. Okay. Well, thanks for the presentation. We had a lot of food for thought. Any questions? Who wants to start? It's our official Brazilian. Question maker. <laughs> Next year we are going to, to have a contest. Who we'll ask more questions, we we'll receive a discount on. <laughs> okay. On Would be great. <laughs> um, on the ethics, like uh, how. Are you imagining, like, ha as you said, like uh, a lot of people are concerned about their privacy, and uh, and uh, that is starting to be one of the main questions. You, uh, at least the projects that you showed, worked as collecting data without questioning for the users, just. Uh, as as I can see at least, and don't uh, gives the impression that uh, you didn't ask for everybody that uh, that uh, you are showing that you are using the data a consent. So how are dealing that? That would be a first question, and uh, uh, second question would be uh, how 
you deal because a lot of uh, a lot of data analysis that you're showing uh, can show a contradictory effect. What I'm meaning by that, for example, you show it that at least 20% of uh, Instagram's followers are fake, but at the same time, uh, you uh, do you have a tool for when you are trying to prove a, a point? about uh, how much interactions, uh, which ones are fake or which one aren't fake, because if not, the, the fake ones are gonna blur your data in some ways. That would be the, the two questions. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I think, I think that the, the, just to take the first one first, um, so the, the, the question of, of ethics and the, and the ethical turn is a, is a much longer subject, huh? So it's, it's something that is hard to just sort of give a few lines of, but um, generally speaking, I think that, that there, there, I just wanna make two, three points. So the first point is the question of um, um, sort of personal privacy versus public interest, right? So when you're when you're studying extremists, so you know you have to be careful because um, one person's extremist is another person's opponent, right? Um, and uh, on the other hand, you could argue, uh, and also the other thing is is you also might not want to give extremists much publicity or much oxygen, as uh, as Whitney Phillips calls it. Um, but then on the other hand, the public interest, of course, journalists. You know, I mean, academics, yeah, it's interesting, like the extent to which academics and journalists sort of share the same kind of ethos. Uh, sometimes, um, but not all the time. Um, but from a journalistic standpoint, of course, so from data journalism, I mean, some of these techniques are for data journalism, uh, it would be in the public interest for these things to be, uh, be known. Um, so this is the first point. The, the, the second one um, has to do um, with um, what constitutes a public figure. And it's an interesting question, right? because you think, you, you think it's kind of straightforward, more or less. However, uh, what is it for Twitter? What is it for Weibo? So for Twitter, it's a public figure as someone that has 5,000 followers. So, so when Twitter releases data sets, those that have under 5,000 followers, they're hashed. Right, that they're they're anonymized, and those above, they're they're open, um, and Weibo it's ten thousand, and but not, not they don't release public, but ten thousand for different reasons, um, for 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 persecution. I don't, I don't want to smile, but I mean, if you have if you say something bad on Weibo and you don't have that many followers, they don't care, the state. But if you have a lot of followers, they care. Um, but anyway. So, so the, the, quite the public figure question is, is something uh, of interest. And then the third point and the final one is, is I think it's important uh, to, to um, follow uh, the precept of uh, sort of contextual privacy. And that is the idea, this is Helen Nissenbaum, the idea that people in social media, they don't expect that when they tweet or when they post that these tweets or posts, even if they agreed to terms of service, are going to be analyzed by academics, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Twitter is, is like, it, it says it about five times in the first, in the terms of service on the first sort of three articles. Like, your data will be, you know, we will be analyzed by, it is public, it is open, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even though it says all those things, you cannot use the terms of service as an academic for cover and say, but the data are, are public. No, you have to do more than that. Um, so I think you have to think about the first two things. Consent is another issue. GDPR is not, uh, is, people are kind of, researchers are kind of afraid of GDPR. GDPR is, is, is really actually open. It's really pro-research. So it says, for example, that if consent is, is improbable, you, you can do other things, right? You can, you can publish, you, you need to publish your research and give people the opportunity to opt out or give the people the opportunity to know about it. So it even has a much lower threshold than consent. Uh, so, so anyway, 
I mean, I didn't want to go on and on about that, but those are at least four points. Um, and then the second one, I find the study of fake followers to be interesting, right? I said that repeatedly. Um, and so the hype auditor technique uh, uses as fake uh, also the signal of inactive. So if you haven't posted or you haven't tweeted for more than, I, I don't know what it is, 12 months, I think, then you're considered to, to be fake. Now, I wouldn't agree with that, um, but it is, a, it is an indication for some techniques. Other techniques, there are different indications. There, there's normal, normally like a list of about 12 signals, and then people use, or peop, like analysts use anywhere between you know, four and all of these different signals. And we could talk about these. This is, this is also the critical analytics project of mine, to study exactly the determination of fakeness, you know, like, and, and why, why would that be fake, um, uh, et cetera. So it's, a, it's, it's, um, it's something worthy of study. And um, yes, we do have techniques, not tools, but techniques to, to, for the determination. I, I call these credibility metrics. So I have this whole um, um, set of metrics that I use to, to think about how people appear to be credi credible online. Um, but that's in, for another, another time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for your your conference. It was very nice. I wanted to know because I'm very curious about YouTube. I, I consume a lot of YouTube content and I follow uh, different uh, YouTubers. And uh, with the issue of um, how you say um, banning hate speech, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, I've seen a lot of YouTubers that complain and that have had cases of like, let's say, it's a humor channel, and they make a joke or whatever, like uh, really not hate speed, like something very, um, let's say not innocent, but not willing, of course, to offend anyone. Or let's say they play video games and they have to role play as if they were a dictator or whatever, you know, like on this humor frame. And many of them, they get like demonetized or striked or banned. And I'm really curious to know, if you know it, whether uh, YouTube algorithms are able to distinguish what it's um, between humor and hate of speech, uh, yeah, hate speech. And uh, whether do you think this, this can change or if there's the, the technological um, support to actually be able to distinguish these two uh, different uh, speeches, let's say. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if people in this room are working on that subject matter, but, but I've, I've started a project on this, so I would uh, encourage you to work on this. Um, so. So the project that I started is called deplatforming, um, and the the question, the very simple question, which is deceptively simple, is the extent to which deplatforming works, and then works for whom, right? So Facebook, uh, and I've done one study, and this will be published in the European Journal of Communication in uh, like a couple of months. It's called it's called deplatforming. So it's, that's the keyword, um, and what we found in that study. So we studied extremist internet celebrities, largely in the US and the UK, uh, who have been deplatformed, especially in the May 2019 purge. So that we're talking about, well, there's a bunch of them, but we're talking about Milo, Alex Jones, Laura Loomer, these sorts of people. Um, and what we found is that um, uh, they migrated to Telegram and to an, an alternative social media ecosystem. And it's very interesting. So I, I made a map of this. I should have showed it. I'll show it in the workshop for those of you. Uh, it's an alternative social media ecosystem with Minds, Parlay, uh, BitChute, uh, Gab, et cetera, et cetera, right? What has happened is, is and we also studied discursively what they say about the, uh, the new platforms and the old platforms. What's happened is that the extremists now really dislike Facebook and Instagram. And they don't link to them, and they don't refer to them. But, so, so, it, so Facebook and Instagram are kind of benefiting in some ways from this deplatforming. However, the extremists still think YouTube and Twitter are extremely relevant, even though they were thrown off. So they're like, can I get on your YouTube show? They, like, can I, like, cross-hosting? Can I, you know, if you, if you, um, if, could you retweet, you know, if you see this message, could you retweet it? Can you send it around on Twitter? So, so Twitter and YouTube have not benefited from this. They're still considered highly relevant. 
that's just one point that I just find interesting. The second one is that um, uh, so there's 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 two ways that content's flagged, right? There's user flagging and there's automated flagging, uh, and um, and then user flagging has a human in the loop, and then automated flagging, we don't know. Right, and th that's why I showed that last thing. So we don't actually know. So we need to uh, we need to research this. And in order to research it, you need to make collections of YouTube URLs at least, but but also videos, if you can, um, and then check back. You know, six months later, whatever. This is how you need to do that kind of longitudinal research. Otherwise, we don't know what's been deleted. I, my, a colleague of mine, Marco Bastos. And I don't know if you know him. He's a Twitter expert. He uh, will be publishing soon a paper on, uh, on the Brexit tweets from 20, 2016. So he had a collection of, I don't know what it is, 3 million or 30 million, I don't know, what the order of 10 is. But anyway, um, what he found was when he went back um, three years later, he found that something like 35% of the uh, leave tweets and the accounts are gone. 35%. What does that mean? Okay, it could mean two things. And both of the things could lead to the same conclusion. Thing one is the users deleted them. They left. Thing two, Twitter deleted them. Okay. So why would the users leave? And why would Twitter delete them? Because there's some sort of influence campaign or some sort of, right? But possibly. So, I mean, this is not what is being concluded. This is what is being surmised. Um, so again, this is because, he, and, and we have the same for, for the 2016 US presidential elections. We can now follow his method, rehydrate. The, so when you share a tweet collection, you probably know this, you have to send it to Twitter first, and then it comes back down. And so those tweets that have been deleted are gone. It's, be, it's to follow the terms of service. You have to be a good partner. So then you can see what's been removed. So you need to create collections uh, in order to study this. Uh, thank you so much for your very interesting, uh, interesting speech. And so um, I'm actually working on uh, ETS per project, and it was a bit difficult for me because I I got my paper rejected twice. Wh what project are you working on? E diaspora project. A diaspora. Yeah, uh, simply because I have been working with um, with biography and this kind of stuff, and so the question, uh, okay, if have been answered something like, okay, this method, we're not sure about if it really represents the people that are behind these webs. Yeah. So that's a, that's a question. So how did you deal with that? And what would you answer this person? So yeah, because for me, it's, it's quite interesting and it's quite evident, but for them, it, it isn't. So that's a question. Okay, so um, I, I think I think you should approach that critically. So I'll just tell you a brief story, and then so you, so uh, I've published two papers on um, on mapping the dias diasporas on social media. So one in the Somali diaspora and one in the Rwandan, and I'll just tell you the story of the Wa Rwandan diaspora because I think it's the most interesting. Um, the Rwandan diaspora on Facebook is quite large, and I can. Uh, talk to you about the techniques of, lo of locating it. I mean, it's basically that you query Rwanda diaspora, not in Facebook graph search, but in Google, oddly enough, like facebook.com, like site colon facebook.com and then Rwanda diaspora. Then you get this list of Facebook pages. Um, so then we did an interliked page analysis as well as, and this was when the API was working, and we did uh, a networked content analysis. So which posts were the most engaged with? What we found was that the um, those people that were critical of the Rwandan regime, and there's much to be critical of the Rwandan regime, that, that's the size of them on Facebook in the diaspora was tiny. And the size of the pro-president, uh, uh, Kagame, the, uh, what's his name? Kagame. Kagame. The pro-Kagame uh, 
uh, presence in the Rwandan diaspora on Facebook was massive. So it's as if it, it's a, it, was, it gives you the picture that the that the that the Rwandan diaspora in general is pro Kagame when that cannot be the case, right? So so on Facebook at least there's this sort of governmental boosterism uh, of the, the showing the diaspora to be to be pro regime. Um, that's a finding, huh? It's not like you don't say then oh Facebook isn't accurate or or you know what I mean? Like you don't say oh it doesn't represent the truth. No. It, what it does is it sh is it shows you who's dominating the discourse in the Rwandan diaspora on Facebook, and then you can ask questions about the extent to which that that's government. It's a government organized diaspora, right? And so you get into these more critical, more interesting research questions. Yeah, so that's how I'd answer it. Thank you for the presentation. Going further with this example on Facebook and also the last one on Twitter, will you recommend to go back to this qualitative analysis with people in order to try to find the reasons of, just for instance, this Twitter example, uh, try to find the reasons why they left the platform or if was Twitter the, the, who, who deleted the, ca the accounts of the, of the mapping and, the, and, the, and this database you, you have in the beginning? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I, I, I would uh, I would encourage uh, one to do that. However, we're talking about um, thirty five percent of three million. So we're we're you know we're talking about about a million accounts. So so this is always this kind of big data moment, and you're like, hmm, okay. So should we be a social scientist and and do a sample? Well, yeah, okay. Uh, should we, how do we do that? Well, like what, what's the next step? Um, and of course they're deleted, so there's a whole ethics in that, right? So, um, so if you delete your Instagram account, I don't know, for some reason, I mean, not you, but one, right? So if, I, like, um, so for example, we recently published a study on fake news in the Netherlands um, for the Ministry of Internal Affairs. So if you ever write a governmental study, uh, you, f you find yourself in this world that you've never been in before, where every citizen uh, feels that they now can attack you on Twitter. So we've been massively trolled, right? So like massively, like, or massively. Like, fi like within, within 48 hours, uh, a thousand hateful tweets from the right. Um, and so, you know, so we're like, hmm, what do we do? Okay, well, let's just turn it off for now, you know, but collect it and see what, it, what we can make of it later. Um, but I could, I could imagine if I weren't a new media researcher, I could imagine just, just, just shutting that account down, right? Okay, three years later, someone comes knocking on my door and says, can I interview you about why you, um, you know, you know, maybe I would be okay with that, uh, or maybe I wouldn't, you know, like, uh, there's some issues there. Maybe it's fine, you know, maybe it's fine. Um, but it's like, you can think of a bunch of scenarios um, where, like, for example, um, where it's not, it's not sort of proper to, to uh, make it known that you know who they are, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, um, we, we had this project with um, where we studied the climate change skeptics on Twitter, and we wanted we and and we made a map, um, a kind of I don't know it was a, it was a bipartite graph it was like users and hashtags, uh, and then and then it was very interesting and so we got, we actually got in touch with the skeptics, um, and said you know is it okay to publish this you know uh, and um, and a few of them were like no way I, I don't want to be known as that. Uh, you know, like as a skeptic, um, like, or I, I don't agree with your terminology or whatever it was, I forget. Um, but at the same time, um, they on Twitter were boasting that they got on the map. It was very weird, right? So, so, so it's like they were happy on the one hand, but they didn't want to be made pu public on the other hand. It's all these kind of complex things. But, but in any case, um, uh, I would encourage a well thought through. I'm just giving you a couple of like little, little anecdotes, but like a well thought through approach 
to you know, qualitatively figuring out where these people went to. I also have a lot of questions. Yeah? Uh, now, my, my, this question is very connected to the last one. You remember 10 years ago, Wire Magazine published these famous articles about the end of science, the end of theory, because they say, okay, big data is here, uh, forget linguistics, forget traditional interpretative sciences and disciplines and so on. Well, you know, Wire Magazine, every year they kill something, the blogs, the web, the science, so they're there killer magazine. Um, so now it's, it's to go deeper into this collaboration, cooperation between quantitative and qualitative research, mm, you know, I, I told you before, most of the people in Latin university, Latin I mean specifically Italian, French, Spanish university, Latin America, we, we have more qualitative approach to in, in media and communication I'm talking. So how can we integrate these different approaches because I think we, we, we need to integrate them. Yeah. So, um, so, so the, I mean, the digital methods, I mean, it, it is quite social science-esque, uh, but it's also in the humanities. Um, um, so that's why I, I kind of situate it in, in both traditions. Um, and so, well, I mean, it, you know, with social science, there's a question of what, I mean, uh, hey, let's start with humanities. In the humanities, it's, the, the goals are, like, you know, criticism and interpretation, uh, you know, and, and, and both of those are fully qualitative. Um, in, the, in the social sciences, um, I don't know if we want to boil it down to something, inference, and um, so, I mean, the, the, there, are, there are a couple of goals, ultimate goals as well. Um, uh, so, in both of those cases, there's there's the, the qualitative um, is uh, is actually more important than the quantitative. If you think about the the uh, what the what the ultimate goals are, so the the point being is that what digital methods tries to do, and I wrote one article about this, and and it's um, it's a it's in the it's in the quanti quality tradition, and I normally. I reverse it and say it's quantity quality, so it's mixed in that sense in itself. So, so it uses um, quantitative techniques for either in the humanities making a collection or in the social sciences making a sample or more generally creating a data set uh, through, uh, through careful consideration, which is quite qualitative, of query design. And I'll go into this in detail in the workshop. So, how do you create a query in order to make a data set that then will answer research questions? And so a lot of the approach more generally is that I refer to, I call it search as research. And it's quantitative, but it's qualitatively informed. And so it's quantitative in the sense that you're grabbing data and making a collection, but you're grabbing the data uh, in, in ways that um, you, where you seek to answer particular research questions through a particular kind of query design. So how do you query, how do you query a, a database? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so all of, these, all of these platforms are databases, or, it's, or maybe, maybe the more co contemporary way to talk about this is instead of saying I'm querying a database, it's saying I'm curating a feed. Right? And so when you're curating, it's already, that's a very qualitative uh, thing to say. Um, and then the feed is the quantitative side. So you're always doing both. I like to do technical field work. So, so um, first, so figure out the, the research affordances of these APIs. Uh, as I said before, think about what kind of objects are there, what kind of fields, um, and then how they're normally used by the platform. And then think about how to remix, repurpose. Uh, and for for research, um, and then derive your research questions that way instead of coming to it with a with a with a with an analytical framework that's already in place. So that's more agile. It's more platform uh, specific. It's more medium centric. I realize that, um, but it's also very qualitative, also at its core. Yeah. So you can talk about interpolation. How do you yeah. interpolate the, the yeah. database? Yeah. 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 Um, I 
it's more, um, you know, the Chinese platforms are arriving, TikTok. Is it complicated or are they open? I, I don't know if have you worked with TikTok, is is the same as working with a Western platform, let's say, or they, they have a different protocols or or maybe the data is not so available? Um, yeah, so I don't know about TikTok. Um, so I haven't looked into that. But but what I did do quite extensively recently is not study the Chinese yet. I'll talk about the Chinese in a second, but but I studied the migration, as I mentioned to you, of, of the extremists who have been deplatformed to this to this alternative social media ecology. And what's interesting about that, um, as a number of things, but one of the things is is that they're they're very open. So if you follow the medium, and this was one of the kind of slogans of of digital methods, um, you um, uh, there there are some opportuni research opportunities available. Um, that is not to say that we would we should stop the critical study of Facebook and Instagram because they cut off their API. No, that's not uh, right. So it's not just blindly follow the medium. We also have to push back. Uh, but but um, so the so the so because researchers are also being deplatformed in in some ways, uh, in a very different way, but in in a, in a way. So, okay, and then the Chinese. Um, so so I mean basically. Um, I mean, there's the there's the smaller ones, or well, now TikTok is becoming larger. But I mean, the the large ones are WeChat and Weibo, and 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 both of those um, are have also over the years sort of become more and more difficult to study. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a couple of techniques that I mean, colleagues at the Chinese University of Hong Kong in particular uh, have developed. Uh, well, the the Hong Kong researchers. Uh, in particular, I've developed a series of techniques where you, which you can use. They're open, um, uh, you know, software to 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 scrape and and so. And then the questions you ask, I mean, it, it's it's kind of difficult. In in here, we could ask far more critical questions than they're asking. It's very complicated, you know. Um, so that the 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 like I would ask: To what extent does the regime's message resonate? Or to what extent are there alternative voices? They can't ans ask those questions uh, because um, because there's a split uh, also in Hong Kong. Um, uh, but they do have the the the, the software and and, uh, and 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 it and is available. I mean, the second thing is is that I don't know what the situation is in Spain, but in a lot of European countries, certainly the UK, there's a huge influx of Chinese students. Into into like digital media courses. We don't. It's not so much in Amsterdam. Uh, we have like you know five percent. But in like King's College London in the digital humanities program, it's like eighty percent. It's like eighty percent in in the UK in King's College. I mean, it's um, and so th then you're kind of you know. Uh, so what should you call your new like what would I call this? I guess I would call it Western digital methods, right? Because it has nothing to do, and because they're always like yeah, but but. Um, you know, if you want to, because we do comparative, uh, so like like the same query in different Google regions, right? So, and and to see where the sources come from. So, for example, if you query Amazonia, in all the South American um, uh, Google regions in Google in the advanced search, you get some sources from South America, but you mainly get sources from Spain. So it's like the, uh, this is it's very interesting. So it's like this kind of neo-colonial search engine suddenly, right? So you it's very, um, and and they're like, yeah, but we can't, you know, for China, you know, it's Baidu, and we have a Baidu scraper, but it's a very different kind of thing, um, you know. So it's it's not symmetrical the the studies, or it's not this. It's so you want to you need to pose different questions. In some sense, you need to redo the curriculum. Um, you know, so so if I had fifty percent or more, I would, I would have a course, a dedicated course. You know, that 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 is on that that stuff, and then another course probably that's a that's a cross. You know, that that compares the two, or um, so. And then and then ultimate and then and then um, um, TikTok. You know, if if we if you if we take seriously the periodization that I put forward for the mainstream social media platforms, so going from the Going from the frivolous and the playful to the issue related uh, to um, to the study of fake, <laughs> basically, to the dark side. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, if 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 it holds for those four, it 
might hold, f I mean, I'm not speculating or predicting, but it could hold for TikTok. So it probably makes sense to start building our scrapers now. First, I would ask something that you were talking about, how Google um, have a kind of a colonization about how you search and how you find your data. So why don't we start looking to DuckDuckGo? Because I encounter problems now that I was trying to search something in Brazil and all the results was related to here and this really bothered me. This is uh, the question, but I have another one that is um, how we look at temporalities in big data. Because, for instance, uh, we were like mining data with NetVis before the, they shut down the, the API. And now we, it's, it's a problem between me and, and Pedro because we are, we are doing this research by ourselves. So it's something completely independent of our current works. Like if the data will get old because we don't have time. So like temporalities in big data. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of in terms of alternatives to to Google, so uh, so there, are, so there are only so what's interesting is this, there's not a general alternative. There's only alternatives on specific features. So so DuckDuckGo uh, advertises themselves as an alternative for privacy, and what was it called? Framasoft or there's a um, there are a couple of European projects that that. Um, 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 advertise themselves as holding data on European servers, right? So these are the two features that are currently folks are using to try to compete with Google. But Google has become a mass media now, so the barriers of entry to that market are so high that you can't get in. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's it, like this idea that, that, you know, someone's developing a search engine in their garage or something that's going to beat Google. It's like, hmm, don't think so. But, but on specific features, right? European servers only or privacy only. Uh, so those are reasons to switch. Um, but the, um, uh, the second question about um, sort of longitudinal studies um, using, so digital methods was devised as a solution to the ephemerality problem, to the instability. So this is why, this is part of the, the follow the medium, the sort of the agility, right? So, so the idea that you look for research opportunities rather than not, right? Rather than coming at it with your, so so the whole philosophy was built around this. So now it's challenged, right? Because we have this Facebook moment. Now what do we do about that? Um, so we're doing three things uh, or four things. Um, one is we're building a scraper. We have to, um, and we should have that up. I don't know in January something. But you don't get the same stuff from a scraper as you get from the API. Um, because the API is is the developer's mode, is the back end, and the scraper is the front end, right? Uh, when you scrape, you're screen scraping. So you're seeing what the user sees, not what the what the developer sees. So it's a, it's a different, right? Um, so do you then say, oh, the data aren't commensurable, let's stop? Or do you say, hey, What's the difference? I think I would do the latter, you know? Like, um, so that's one thing. And then you can develop critique of, of relying only on backends and APIs, right? Because you could say that what the user sees is far more significant than what the developer sees. Because what the user sees is, is an actual feed. It's, actually, it's an actual existing user. So you're, you're, you, know, you have to be logged in. So you get the personalized stuff, whereas Whereas with the back end, it's not personalized, right? So you get these in engagement counts where you say, this is the most engaged with post, and it is the most engaged with post, but 20% of the users didn't see it, even though it's most engaged with for various reasons, or we don't even know what percentage. Okay, so this is one thing, which is interesting. So make it into an interesting problem, um, as opposed to something that's, that's um, so problematic you can't continue. The, the other one is, is like manual small data approaches. We can talk about that. Another one, well, one example is this counter archiving Facebook project that's that's uh, being done at the Open University of um, in Jerusalem, um, in Tel Aviv. Sorry, the Open University of Israel. I forget what the how that ends. Open University is how it begins. Um, 
And, uh, and so this is, these are very time specific. These are like event based, elections based, right? So you're, 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 you're bounded temporally. Um, and so so your, your research, because of the ephemerality of the medium, means bounded temporality. That's, that is, that's doing business with the, with the medium. Um, um, and um, and then, then the last one is, of course, um, what I guess is something that just like always abides, and that's the ethnographic. Um, and so developing sort of like a robust, so people will say, oh, you know, we're doing a digital ethnography. Uh, and then they don't really explain what that means. I mean, I, you know, uh, so, so what's a digital ethnography um, uh, with an API and without an API, with a scraper and without a scraper? Uh, and, and, and what are these sort of advantages, disadvantages? So, so I would then dig into the, the, you know, the ethnography or whatever the terms are um, as a as a uh, as an alternative um, these days. There's also the data journalism side to it. There's also media monitoring, um, and if you if you want to do the, the if you still want to get to the, the the data side, you can use marketing tools. I mean, I use BuzzSumo all the time, so I use CrowdTangle. So that that gives you which URLs, not Facebook pages, but web URLs are most engaged with on Facebook. You get that data uh, through CrowdTangle. And now CrowdTangle, some sort of premium service is available through the Facebook Social Science One project. I'm not a fan of Social Science One. I can go on and on uh, with critical remarks. Um, but if they do indeed, as my colleagues told me that they did very recently, actually roll out a version of, a kind of advanced version of CrowdTangle, use it. Thank you for the for your presentation. I'm sorry for my voice. And <clears throat> I'm I'm going to make a question about my thesis. I'm working in activists, environmental activists, and I am studied in online and offline. In the online, um, I'm working with a data set that comes from Twitter, from a hashtag that uh, activists use. Uh, I'm, I'm dealing with this uh, worry. What about boats? Boats, you know? Yeah. And uh, the second question will be, um, what about uh, some people is questioning uh, about uh, technological determinism? And maybe it, it could be uh, one of my worries too. So how do you deal with that? I come from social science too, so is is a question that I have in my in my thesis. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I don't know really what to say about the technological determinism points, but I will say some. I mean, maybe you can say a couple more words what you mean by that issue. But um, the on the on the bots side, um, so on Twitter, so I mean, there have been a couple of interesting studies. Um, uh, on the Brazilian elections, for example, um, on the sort of the presence of bots. And there was a higher incidence there than normal. And normal is like 10%. Uh, but in, in, that, in, the, in the Brazilian elections, in a, in a couple of, for a couple, around a couple of candidates, around one candidate in particular, um, I guess you can guess which one, um, there was, a, there was, a, there was a, the question of artificial amplification. Um, so, I guess I, I guess I would say two things. First of all, um, if you if you dig into the study of bots, you'll find this range of approaches from fully quantitative to fully qualitative, and and it's very interesting uh, literature. Um, and uh, and I and I think like the mo the most significant bot detection um, moments were for accounts that that were really well done. Like it didn't seem like bots, 
and they, and they, they evaded the automated detection. Um, so I think that there's a major role there for qualitative research, but you need to first use a quantitative, have to, you don't have to, but it's probably a good idea to first, because you're dealing with large data sets, to use a quantitative method uh, whereby you say, if, um, if a tweet or if an account um, has at least four of these signals out of 12, then it might be a bot, then it's suspicious or it's flagged. And then you go into it qualitatively. Um, so I think that that's a way to, to study bots. It's a, the two-step process instead of trying to sort of have these pure, fantasy, you know, pure automated fantasies. Um, but I think what you mean by the techno-determinism point is, is, that, is that, so normally that's a critique, right? But you're meaning that maybe that the technology is determining outcomes? of the elections, no, or something? I'm not sure what you mean by that. But, um, but there is, um, what I find interesting about this debate is that the, um, it's also the same with, uh, in a different way, with the personalization debate on Google, the, the number of results that are personalized. The number of significant tweets that are, come from bots are actually quite lower um, than people imagine. So with the personalization, it's like 10%, and with bots, it's like 10%. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot lower. But then when it goes above that level, that's when you say, aha, uh, that's when you, you've made a significant finding. So when, when, um, when the like engaged with like retweeted, like significant, so retweeted tweets, um, uh, the most significant retweeted tweets, the ones with the highest engagement, if you get those coming from more than 10% of bots, that's a, then you have your techno-determinism, possibly, because, because then, then there's quite major amplification coming from bots. We have the Brazilian bots, Bolsonaro's. Um, more questions here. More question from Brazil. The Brazilian blog is asking many questions today. Hello from Portugal, but uh, same language, yes. yes. Um, uh, I have a question, and one is uh, some like a commentary. I would like to hear your thoughts about it. The other may be harder, so I, for, I apologize if you think it's unfair. But my first question is now we are seeing that social media uh, responsibles are being held into, uh, they are being hold, held accountable. There are there's a talks about whether or not the platforms are responsible for the content, and there are different positions. I would first, as a commentator and an observer, I would like to hear you think. Uh, wh what are your thoughts on the issue? Should social media uh, platforms be responsible or not for what users post in there, and how does that relate to moderation? And second, if you see a way of, uh, if you envision a way of researching this a kind of a empirical way to approach this question and to because i, I i've been thinking and i would, i'm this is the hard question so I don't don't please don't feel obliged to find a very definitive answer but i'm curious about this is there a way that as researchers we can help this debate go forward yeah that's an interesting question uh, thank you for that um so generally speaking um like like um and I'll, I'll also talk about this briefly in the workshop if you're coming. Um, that is that if you look at the history of the study of the web as different sorts of spaces, um, and I mentioned previously cyberspace, and you know, but I, I gave you four periods, but we could also um, compress that and, and talk about, I don't know, cloud space, social space, locative or geospace, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, bloggers, like all these different ideas. Most recently, I think we're in the comment space period. Um, and um, and the, it is a, a, along with the comment space period has been, you know, this, this sort of, this lowering of the threshold of inhibition and, and, a, and the rise of toxicity and, and interesting concepts that have been uh, developed, right? So, so, so people talk about, well, there's hate speech, but online they use the term, well actually, you know, because it's ironic and insincere and sort of jokey, 
Um, you might, we might need a different term. Um, so some people are using the term extreme speech, some are using the term toxic speech, etc. Anyway, so in this larger context, I think the, the, the question of um, the study of moderation and content review. And so all of the platforms have their own terms for this, right? And none of the terms are editor, right? <laughs> Okay, so exactly what you're saying. So it's not there. So that they continue to try to be intermediaries, in a Latourian sense, and also in a media regulatory sense. So like channels, like a telephone conversation where n nothing it's unfiltered going through, right? So what you say on one end is heard on the other end. That's what the platforms want you to believe that they are, but in fact, uh, they are um, uh, mediators in the Latourian sense. So the content is transformed. Uh, and it's transformed in a number of ways. Um, so I think um, to begin to answer your, your question of the way forward, uh, I think the, the what we need to do is, and I would, if it were me and I were doing this, I would do it on a, again, because I'm really platform centric. So so like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, YouTube just came out with, a, they had this um, big announcement uh, two days ago, um, uh, no, I've, now I've forgotten the term. So they have another term. So they all have different terms, and they all have different specific, um, you know, guidelines that they all have for the study of what constitutes whatever kind of content, right? So some of it's offensive, some of it's called organized hate. They deplatform Facebook, deplatform, and Instagram deplatform dangerous individuals. So all of these cusp terms. Right? So it's no longer, it's not pornography, it's not violence, pornography, hate. No, There's, uh, the, it's moved. The slider has moved over here. And so it's this portion of the spectrum of content that, that should be studied, uh, I would argue. And then I would do it in at least three ways. I would do it, number one, um, the, 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 the technicity of the determination. That's number one. So, so the, the combination of the automated, fully automated, semi-automated, and non-automated. Uh, number two is I would study the guides, the actual manuals that, that are given to these content reviewers, right? And they're so interesting. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the janitors or the whatever this movie's called, the cleaners. Um, you know, where they have to decide in, in, in milliseconds. You know, and it's just, it's an A-B. Right, so A, B testing, so accept or don't accept, right? Um, but but the guidelines and the conf the conflicts in those guidelines are so interesting, you know. Like this, Facebook is just it's it's so detailed, um, and the learning thereof, and so most of the commentary focuses on you know the psychol the psychological damage of looking at all this content. Yeah, I get that, I get that, but there's also the, the, the making of, this, the, the, there's also the creation of all these distinctions. I mean, I think that that's fascinating. I would study that. Uh, and then thirdly, I would make collections, right? So I would, I've talked about this before. So I would make, uh, I would systematically, and then these collections, you don't have to sort of become a web archivist overnight or something, you know, or develop crawlers and all this jazz. But I would definitely make at least URL lists and, and maybe URL, URL lists with screenshots. I mean, we can go up, we can climb the ladder, right, of, of how far we want to go. Uh, but I mean, f we just built a screenshot generator, for example. Um, and so you can, you know, you, have, you, you put in a list of URLs and you set the time in between how long you want the page to wait to load and then ch right? And so you can create a collection automated. You can run this and create collections. Uh, and uh, and so you know and then and then the then you know the PhD or the postdocs or your researchers will come up to you and say, oh, did you get the metadata with that? No, sorry. You know, so, so there's more you can do than that. You know that that screenshot. You know you want more than that probably. Um, did you get some teaser? T you know the description text in Google, like when you made these URLs. Like, could you, did you grab that? No, sorry, I forgot to grab that. You know, so you can think. You know, maybe that needs a lot of careful consideration. What you what you grab, but you need to make collections, or, or some form. So then you can check what's gone. So those three projects. Uh, hi, Richards, and thank you for your presentation. But unfortunately, I was not here, so I lost the presentation. So uh, first, sorry for not being here. Uh, um, I would like to take 
take advantage of the fact that you are here uh, along with Carlos Scolari, because uh, and probably you, you were talking in the presentation, uh, one of the trends in the last 10 years in analyzing social media is the use of some concepts of or metaphors like the um, um, echo chambers, filter bubbles, and so on, that were used at the very beginning as a good uh, way of describing what was happening in social media, in particular for political communication, but that have been criticized in the last two or three years, in particular Axel Bruns, our clique. Axel Bruns just wrote a book a year ago about that. Yeah, And my question is, uh, taking into account that Carlos Colari, for instance, uh, he is used to use a really powerful metaphor on the media system, like the ecological metaphor, ecology, which gives a lot of information about what is happening in media, really, the spices and all the uh, things that uh, can be related to this metaphor. We're using what I would consider, and I would like to know what's your opinion, a really poor metaphors to explain really complex processes that are happening in the social media ecosystem, echo chambers and filter bubbles in particular. And I'd like to know what is your opinion about that? Do you think that we have to develop or to use more powerful, more powerful metaphors to explain what's happening? That's great. Because I was thinking about the same, because you're talking your next, uh, next article will be about deep um, platforming. And I have also worked in mediatization theories. Now we are talking about deep mediatization, Andrea Hepp. So we should also reflect on that. No? Because if deep, that means it's a 3D environment. We are going deeper and deeper. So this use in, in two different, very close fields, mediatization, mediatization theories and digital method, we are talking about this going deep. But it's, it's, it's this, we are in the same dimension, the, the language and the metaphor we use, because they're very important when, because the metaphor models the way you are doing the research. No? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, uh, uh, yes, so th thank you. Uh, so, uh, so we've developed two terms, um, which we think um, that they haven't been really taken up so much, but we, st we still like them. Um, one is device culture. And the other one's uh, ranking culture. Um, and both of those ideas um, take into a, well, they're both the study of the outputs um, of social media, right? So there's, so it's in some ways a study of the feeds. And the study of the feeds can be studied from an echo chamber, a filter bubble point of view, or you can begin to develop other terminology. So the terminology that we've developed is device culture and ranking culture. And ranking culture was developed by Bernard Reeder and device culture I developed with a couple of colleagues. And, what, and they're very similar, um, but what they try to capture is this idea um, that um, um, the outputs are iterative and recursive, right? And so uh, um, first and foremost, um, that one, one point. So, so it's the, they're taking into account so outputs of social media in feeds, etc. Recommendations. They're taking into account um, uh, what you're doing, as well as what your environment is doing. Yeah, uh, and and uh, and outputting a, a accordingly. The second thing is, and this is where the deep um, point comes in. Um, so I think you might want to add, or we should add. I don't know if deep's the right word, probably. Um, the word deep to it, so deep ranking culture, deep device culture, because there's there's a deeper back end in play, and that's and that's the commercial side and the advertising side, um, which which some which the filter bubble uh, doesn't take into account. Uh, so the so or or it does, but but uh, it could take it into account more explicitly. So the filter bubble, as you know, was developed by Eli Parizer to, to describe Google. Right, so this is 2009, December 2009. Google flipped the switch. No longer did we get universal results, but we got personalized results. And then his in his in his famous TED talk, he showed the query for Egypt, and one friend got the Nile River, and the other friend got Egyptian Revolution in the images. Right, and he's like, see, filter bubble. 
Um, and so then the, the dangers of the fields of bubble, et cetera. You know, know, know all this, this story. I think it's been applied not, not, not inaccurate, not, um, uh, I think it, uh, the way it's been applied to the study of Facebook is not bad, I don't think. I mean, like the, the famous uh, piece was in the Wall Street Journal uh, around the 2016 US elections. It ran until August of this year. It was called Red Feed, Blue Feed, or Blue Feed, Red Feed. And they emulated feeds of those who would be on the left of the political spectrum or on the right, according to the kinds of media that they were likely to consume, which were on the basis of independent study of the types of media consumed by the left and the right in the US. And so they emulated feeds. And then they thereby showed a bubbles, right, or echo chambers. And I think that that was well done. But the thing is, is that that was, n that was not a real case, right? So this is like, again, relying only on the back end of the API. I mean, that they weren't doing that. But I think to, to, I think to update this, uh, one needs to, um, you know, grab the, grab the front end, um, actually, you know, scrape the, the outputs. Um, there are a, a couple of researchers at Northeastern who are particularly good at this, uh, studying the Facebook uh, newsfeed uh, at the moment. Um, I was just with Christian Sandvig uh, last week in Copenhagen, who, who's a big proponent of algorithmic auditing, who, who developed that term, who's actually suing the US government. I don't know if you've heard about this, it's very interesting. Um, preemptively suing, so that when you, when you save, when you break the terms of service of all these mainstream platforms and you save the outputs of algorithms in order to not study trade secrets, but study algorithmic bias and the power of al algorithms and machine bias and this sort of thing, discrimination, um, that, that you can do that legally as researchers. So that, that this is, but anyway, um, I think, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm one of these people who I'm pro-scraping, uh, so I break the terms of service all the time. Um, uh, so I, st I think that that's the way to go um, in order, to, in order to, to study it. And I think, um, but at the same time, I think that one does need also to study um, the, the, you know, the, the quote unquote, the back end, not the secret sauce, not the, al not the not, we don't need to read the code, uh, but we do need to understand um, the, uh, the logics of, of advertising behind the recommendations. So you get, you get the front end filter bubble plus the back end. That's how I would go about it. And we could call it deep, use Bernard's term, Bernard Rita's term, deep ranking cultures as what I want. Uh, this man has to eat something before the workshop, so we have to stop. Um, the, the workshop is in for the people who has in Tang ah, la sala de graus, la tercera planta in Tanger. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, thanks for sharing your research and knowledge with all these people, young people. Mm, many of them are starting the PhD in, in these weeks, so well, they have a lot of inputs for for the future. Um, <laughs> if you were starting your PhD, would you learn a program language? And if so, which would you choose? Ooh. If you're tech, if you're technically inclined, I would dabble in Python and R. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And if not, then um, then don't worry. That's the other part of it. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.